Positional encoding. It is one of the most fundamental requirements of the transformer. Suppose we have a look at the architecture. We'll see that it is the first thing that the embeddings go through. Let's start today by first understanding why we need positional encoding and what would it entail if it weren't there. Then we will talk about how to make a positional encoder and what the requirements are. Finally, we'll end with an understanding of how different positional encoders work. Beginning with an example to understand the need for PE. I will be calling it PE for the rest of the video as positional encoding is a mouthful. Jack loves to eat pizza. We take this sentence, break it down into its respective tokens, then convert these tokens to embeddings. Notice that PE is usually added after this step. Let us skip that. These embeddings are then sent to the encoder. If we look inside the encoder, the sentence Jack loves to eat pizza or pizza loves to eat Jack is the same. Now we wouldn't want that, would we? The embeddings are sent in parallel to the encoder without any positional information about where the word came from. These two sentences are no different from a nonsensical sentence like to loves Jack pizza eat. Moving on to how to make a positional encoder. Of the multiple rules, the first and the most obvious one being each position should have a unique encoding. If that weren't the case, two different words at different locations will be treated to be in the same location by the model. Second, there should be a linear relation between two encoded positions. If we have a look at the PE of these words, I can predict the position of pizza just by looking at two because for each next word, two is being added to the position. Third, irrespective of the sequence length, it should work. Imagine a scenario where the longest sentence encountered during training is 256 words and one during inference or while running the model is 1024 words. In this case, if our PE cannot generalize, it will fail to work. Fourth, there should be a deterministic mathematical process that the model can learn. Here, let's create a simple formula. The position of any word is equal to two times the location of it plus one. And finally, it should work in multiple dimensions. As transformers are not only used in 1D datasets like language, but 2D datasets like images, and believe it or not, it goes up to ND datasets. From listening to all these rules, the simplest and most obvious PE that comes to mind is integer encoding, or simply adding the location of the word. Let us see where this will work and where it will fail. If we begin with our previous example, Jack loves to eat pizza, take the word loves, convert it into its respective embeddings, then add the position to it, we can see that it works quite well. But imagine if we have a longer sentence, a huge paragraph, and in the middle of the paragraph comes the sentence, Joe has the best pizza. Now let's take Joe, convert it into embeddings, and then add its position. Here we run into a problem. We can see that the position was so large that it essentially took over the embeddings and we have lost all the information from the embeddings. This is the issue with integer encoding. It works for very small sentences but breaks down quickly as the sentences grow. Let us look at the PE that was used in the transformers, sinusoidal encoding. But before that, if you are enjoying the video, consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon. It really helps out. Now back to the video. As intimidating as the equation looks, it is quite simple once we break it down into its respective components and understand what is going on. POS stands for position or the location of the word in the sentence. I stands for the index of the dimension of the embedding. It will make more sense in a bit. D model is the dimension of the embeddings you have chosen and 10,000 is a scaling factor which is determined experimentally. Let us forget about embeddings for a moment and just imagine we have the position of a word. We can find the PE of that by writing PE pos is equal to sine pos. If we plot that out, we can see that for different positions we get different values. 
Now let's bring back the embeddings into the picture. What we essentially did by writing PE pos is equal to sign pos is calculate the encoding for just the first location of the embedding vector. What we now need to do is calculate the same value for each i. Looking at the equation again and plotting it out along with cosine, we can see for each position and for the different i, we have different values. These values then can be added to the embedding vector for each position and we have added positional information to the sentence. If you are a curious person, you may ask, why do we need the cosine as well? It comes from our need for a linear relationship. Here is a simple mathematical proof. If you do not enjoy the maths, feel free to skip one minute ahead. By comparing these values, we can see that u1 is equal to cos wik, v1 is equal to sin wip, and so on. And this mk is a simple rotation matrix. Nowadays, the state of the art PE is rotary position encoding. The reason rope was created was first, when we use sinusoidal encoding, we add information to the embeddings vector which is essentially polluting the information presented. Second, we can only know the absolute position of words, but never know how two words are at a relative distance from each other. This is important because if two words are far apart, they most likely are not strongly related. Let us again start with our example, Jack loves to eat pizza. Now, if you take the words Jack and pizza, put them in the coordinate system, we will see that there is an angle that forms between them. Rope works by manipulating this angle rather than the vectors themselves. So if more words get added between Jack and Pizza, it increases the angle. Whereas if the whole sentence length is increased or decreased, it still preserves the relative distance between the two words. This is the equation for rope. R theta is a rotation matrix. To understand how rope works, we need to revisit the self-attention equation. If you need a refresher on the topic, consider watching my video on it. Now, if you have a look at the equation, particularly at the Q dot K transpose step, it is a dot product. A dot product can also be written as Q multiplied by K transpose multiplied by cos theta. Now we can rotate this theta as we please to introduce positional information. Let us take a simple example. This is delicious. For simplicity's sake, the dimension of our embeddings is 6. Starting with this, we create pairs of these embeddings. Each of these pairs is rotated by a value m times theta, m being the position of the world. This theta value is calculated by the following formula, and i represents the index of the embedding vector as it did in sinusoidal encoding. Having calculated the theta, we calculate the rotation for the pairs of embeddings by multiplying theta and the index of the word m. For this, all values are zero, as the index of the word is zero. For is, the calculated values are 0 0.1, 0 0.4, and 0 0.6. So the embeddings are rotated by these values. Here is a simple summary of what is going on. We take the words, convert them into embeddings, then pair them up and rotate them by a value. Keep in mind, these are not exactly embeddings that we are rotating, but Q multiplied by K transpose. Now you have a complete understanding of positional encoding. Congratulations. Thank you. Consider subscribing if you enjoyed the video.